Here Elvis direct from his army quarters in Germany. He'll be interviewed on K-Boy by Tom Moffat. From sunrise to sunset. Modest new voice in music today. He has a name that says well known locally as many of the acts that he's presented to Hawaii. From Elvis Presley to Frank Sinatra. From Michael Jackson to Bruno Mars. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Mr. Tom Moffat. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. If you grew up in the 60s, this is how you heard the latest and greatest music, a transistor radio. There were no music videos, no iTunes, it was just you and a disc jockey. The faceless voice spinning the hottest hits from artists like the Beatles, Elvis Presley, and Paul Revere and the Raiders. In Hawaii, the radio station leading the way in rock and roll music was K-Poi, and K-Poi's most popular DJ was Uncle Tom Moffat. Now, you would think that a man who has such a passion for rock and roll grew up in the big city, LA, Chicago, New York, but not Tom Moffat. Where did you begin life? In Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan. Uh -huh. Well, what was it like? Cold. <laughs> I didn't like the city, and uh, I had relatives who lived outside of Detroit, so in my uh, eighth grade, my folks let me work for this cousin of ours who had a mink ranch in a little town called Waterloo, Michigan. So I spent uh, my eighth grade in this little town in a one-room schoolhouse. How many kids? Well, it was from kindergarten to eighth grade. <laughs> it was full. <laughs> now, what didn't you like about the city? I don't know. I didn't like the congestion. I liked the country. I was just, I just liked the country. I liked the feeling of being outdoors and uh, just that nice feeling of <laughs> inhaling. And <laughs> what did you do at the mink ranch? Fed the mink, cleaned up after him. And, uh, and enjoyed it? Oh, yeah. 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 And I had a, a pet pig, Herman, and uh, we were left over. We, we fed the mink horse meat. And, and, and cereal, and there was always some of that left over, so I fed the pigs what was left over. And the pig became very healthy. He, weighed, uh, he was pretty young, weighed 315 pounds when I took him to the county fair, and he won first place. Wow. So then we took him to the state fair, which was uh, at uh, Michigan State University, in the very same uh, football field where they play football now, I showed my pig. He didn't win, but... <laughs> <laughs> Did you go K through 12 or, or not? You no, when I graduated, then I returned to Detroit to go to school. And uh, again, I wasn't too happy. I got a job washing dish, uh, dishes in a restaurant called Curly's. And the people who owned it had a farm about 40 miles outside of Detroit. And they took me out there one day and I fell in love with it. And so they needed, they needed somebody to work on the farm. So I talked to my folks and they let me uh, go into high school working on the farm. So you've been away from eighth grade, and then you went, you, you went I, away again in high school. Yeah, I, I spent one year at Detroit in, in high school there. I just wasn't happy. So I went 10th, 11th, 12th grade, at, uh, ended up in South Lyon High School. And graduated from there? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. And then what? Well, I played football and basketball there, and uh, I got a scholarship in my senior year to play, play football for a very famous coach, who wasn't a famous coach uh, at the time. But uh, he, he had a, he was his first coaching job. He had graduated from the University of Michigan. And uh, I got this scholarship offer. What position did you play? I played tackle. <laughs> I was a farm boy. <laughs> so I remember going to Bowling Green, Ohio, and seeing his team play and sitting on the bench with he and the players. And I really was excited about it. But I have the correspondence from, from him, not my letters, where I kept writing asking, you know, if I get hurt in football, will my scholarship still be in effect? I couldn't get a definite answer. So I decided to go to work for a while in a factory and earn enough money to go to college. By the way, the coach uh, is George Allen. George, I was going to yes. ask you. Wow. <laughs> Los Angeles Rams, Washington Redskins, Hall of Fame. <laughs> and did you want to play for him? I mean, did he, oh, yeah. did he, he evoke was, that leadership? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I liked him. But I was just, you know, what happens if I get hurt? I don't have a scholarship. I don't have any money. And I didn't want to go to my folks for money. So I, I worked in a Dodge plant and then the Michigan's uh, seamless tube company in my hometown of South Lyon. So I spent uh, a year working there to save enough money to go to college. 
It's said that Hollywood actress Lana Turner was discovered at a drugstore on Sunset Boulevard. In Tom Moffat's life, the corner drugstore would provide that little catalyst which would take him away from the Dodge plant and send him to a place he would come to call home. One day I'm in the corner drugstore in South Lyon on my way to the tube company to work, and uh, it was a steel mill, and uh, I found this little book about colleges in the United States. The last page was uh, University of Puerto Rico and University of Hawaii. So I want to travel and go to school. I got interested in the University of Hawaii, and that's how I ended up in Honolulu. When you got here, was it what you expected? Yeah, it was. It was uh, more than I expected. I didn't quite know what to expect, but I, I could just feel the love of people and uh, just uh, the, the feeling of Hawaii when I so, got here. So you didn't have trouble breaking into local culture or? No, I kind of <laughs> fell into it. <laughs> and knew you were going to stay? Well, I, I, I didn't know. I, I don't know at, at the time. Uh, if I knew I was going to make this my home, but after I spent some time here, I, this was it. So I went to school and where wanted to be an attorney. Where did you live when you first got to the island? Manoa Valley, not far from here. <laughs> not far from here. Do you remember the street? Yeah, Hillside Avenue. A beautiful place to live. Yeah, it was. And you know, UH went fine for you. What were you majoring in? A law. I want to be a lawyer. And then my first year, I had a speech teacher who said, you have a nice voice, you should get in the radio guild. Now, is that the first time you've been told you have a nice voice? Yeah, yeah. I'm amazed. Well, in a farming town, they don't, <laughs> I don't know. They don't, care how, they don't care how deep your voice is. <laughs> but I'd never been, been in a speech class before either. So I joined the radio guild and got interested in being a radio announcer. So at the end of my first year, I, uh, I auditioned for KGU and didn't make it as, an, as a junior announcer. So I went to work at Tripper Hospital uh, mopping floors. I why mopped you, every yeah. stairway in Tripler Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> why, don't, why do you think you didn't get the job as a freshman? Well, it was pretty competitive. There were only like just a handful of radio stations there. And uh, KGU, KULA, KGMB, that was about it. And a couple of language stations. So good experience, but off you went to mop the floors. Yeah, so I and, uh, but went back to school and I'd go home every night and read the newspaper aloud and talk and, and read, read stories. Uh, Nobody was around, I'd, I'd just read every night loud. So anyway, come uh, the following June, I went back to KGU and got a job. I really got into it. I became a staff announcer at KGU. This is before disc jockeys, really. Uh, Were you always reading, or did you make well, I didn't up what I you're didn't, saying? I would do a little bit of news, and you come in between network programs and give a station break, and maybe a 30-second commercial. <laughs> and you're operating the equipment oh, as yeah. you're speaking, too. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was on the third floor of the advertiser building. And there was still the uh, tower was on top of the building that was uh, the antenna for the, the radio station. Uh, I did just about everything. We recreated baseball games. Uh, Joe Rackham up Rose and Carlos Rivas and Frank Valenti were also in the same game, but I was Joe's board operator. He'd be in the other room and he'd get teletype reports of what was happening with the baseball game, New York Yankees and Boston or whatever. And he'd recreate these games. And I had three turntables or four turntables. One was just a regular crowd. Another was excited crowd, uh, one was booze, and the other was a 7-Up vendor. Get your 7-Up! That was one of his sponsors. So you hear this guy in the, in the, in the stands selling 7-Up. <laughs> and who was making the crack of the bat? Joe would do that. Oh. Yeah, and he had one do of those, that live. Uh, he had one of those uh, uh, pieces of wood they used, the drummers used sometimes. But you could, and he'd hit that with a pencil. <laughs> oh, those were the days when we didn't get those games piped in. Oh, no. It was, they were all delayed. I mean, it was just recreated. The only way you could get here is short wave, and that was kind of expensive, I guess, or it, it wasn't that clear. So they all recreated these games. <laughs> and nowadays, people are used to consolidated uh, radio stations with the same voice recorded on, mm -hmm. uh, on channels throughout the nation. But in those days, it was all one of a kind and local. It was quite glamorous, too. I remember the, 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 being nervous the first time the microphone opened, and I had to say, this is KGU in Honolulu. Uh, high atop the advertiser building, <laughs> things like that. Did you attract fans? Not then. A uh, little bit, maybe. Uh, people were interested, enamored with radio announcers, even then. Uh, although we didn't say that much sometimes. <laughs> News, sports recreations, a little bit of music. That was radio back in the 50s. Tom Moffat was just beginning to see how the power of radio could influence the tiny community that was Hawaii. Now at KGU, I, 
I fell in love with being a commercial announcer. So when school started in the fall, I decided I was learning more at KGU than I was at the University of Hawaii, so I stayed on as a radio announcer. And uh, I remember coming home, and I, I remember meeting Ella Fitzgerald at KGU, and we had some tickets for her concert that night at McKinley High School Auditorium, and I went home to change. And in the letterbox was a draft notice. You will report to, and so that was the end of my radio career at KGU. So I, I remember learning it that night, but I went to the concert and uh, saw Ella Fitzgerald at McKinley High School. <laughs> Did she pack it? Oh yeah, oh yes. <laughs> McKinley High School. Mm -hmm. And many years later, I would present her in concert. <laughs> So where did you go to report for the draft? Where did you serve? I, I, came, I reported here, and I reported to Schofield for 16 weeks of basic training. And this was during the Korean War, and we were all being shipped off to Korea. So when we, just when we concluded our basic training, this tough old sergeant called me in and said, look, he said, uh, you don't want to go off to this war if you, you know. <laughs> he just kind of said, hey, you've got a talent, and uh, they need a radio announcer at uh, Armed Forces Radio at Tripper Hospital. I'll lend you my car. He gave me the keys, and I drove to Tripper Hospital. And since I'd had uh, some training in commercial radio, they grabbed me up right away. So I spent uh, the next two years defending my country at Tripper Hospital. <laughs> what were you voicing? Uh, they ran pretty much the same things we ran at KGU, uh, the big transcriptions, the Jack Benny show, the Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy show, Suspense, Dragnet, Escape, all these shows, they were like half-hour shows. And you put a a big 50-minute disc on and go from that to the next one, then come in between and give a station break. And that went only to a military population? Yes, in Tripler Hospital. They called it the Bedside Network. Only in Tripler? Yeah. And that was yeah. your draft service? Uh-huh, that was it. A place where you'd been mopping floors previously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. And did, that you was do, fun. did you do that throughout your, your time Yes, I service? stayed there for the rest of my Army career. And I, then I went back to KGU, and then I started at KIK also. So I was working at three radio stations, really. I do my you know, army duty at Tripler and work my eight hours, and then I work in the other stations. So I began my disc jockey career, really, at uh, KIKI. Wow. It's kind of fun. Do you ever hook up with any of the guys you trained with at Schofield? Uh, yes. Unfortunately, uh, I had a few days off before I had to report to Tripler Hospital. And when I did report, one of the guys was coming down a gurney. He'd gone to Korea and got shot and had returned to the hospital already. That was, uh, and I, quite a few of them came back injured, Tripper Hospital. At the time, uh, a lot of the entertainers who came to Hawaii on vacation, Jack Benny and George Burns came up one time, and I interviewed them on the radio, and then they toured the, the different, uh, different areas of Tripper Hospital visiting with patients. Uh, another time, uh, Louis Armstrong came up and performed at the Post Theater. So I had the pleasure of introducing him on stage. And one of my favorite stories is I'm sta on stage kind of nervous because this is Louis Armstrong. And the place is packed, and the band is on stage, and where's Mr. Armstrong? I'm looking around him. So I went out in the parking lot. There he is. The parking lot's deserted because everybody's inside. He's with his signature handkerchief and trumpet rehearsing, blowing his horn. Anyway, the show got underway. It was great. <laughs> A special moment seeing him out there with the, <laughs> he had this white handkerchief that he always used playing the trumpet. And there he was out in the parking lot, tuning up. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> yeah. on. <laughs> and so a career was born. Tom Offit was spinning stacks of wax. And like any good disc jockey, he was taking the musical temperature of his local listeners, giving them what they wanted. And what they wanted was a style of music that would revolutionize radio and give Tom his identity. So I started this jazz show on KIKI. And, but I, I would play other things too, like, uh, you know, Nat Cole and things like that, and Frank Sinatra. And all of a sudden, I started listening to this music uh, and getting requests for a guy with a funny name, Elvis Presley. And I started playing his music, and that's where it exploded. All of a sudden, every kid in the island was listening. I was the only one playing, uh, in the islands, really. I was the only one playing rock and roll. So it started, I used to get like 50-some letters a day. <laughs> requesting. And I started doing a show from a drive-in where uh, Ward Warehouse is now, uh, right by the corner of uh, Ward and, and uh, Alamona Boulevard, right across from Fisherman's Wharf. This is a drive-in restaurant, not no, drive-in movie, right? No, it was a drive-in restaurant called the White Top Drive-In. It became kind of the social center of Honolulu. Uh, and I was there every night from 9 o'clock till 
midnight, I think, or one o'clock. Could people see you doing the show? Oh yeah, it was. In, it was. Uh, it was a fellow had a, a show called the Fishbowl Show. His name was Don Chamberlain. Then he left town, and this empty thing was sitting there, and they could move it around. So I turned it into Uncle Tom's Cabin. A listener once wrote and said Uncle Tom or something like that. I, I got this moniker Uncle Tom's, and Uncle Tom. They started addressing the letters to Uncle Tom's Cabin. So it's, I called the, the show Uncle Tom's Cabin. So that's what I called this former fishbowl. Then you got to perform with more than your voice. You, you had audiences. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they would come, and the car hops would bring dedications from different cars. And, and you were the first to play rock and roll mm -hmm. music on radio in yeah. Hawaii? Yeah. Wow. It was fun. <laughs> it was exciting. And that must have just swept. Through. I mean, so pretty soon you're doing a rock and roll show. Oh, yeah. That was it. The, the jazz was forgotten. <laughs> but I still hung out with the musicians. And we used to go to jam sessions. And a good friend of ours was Joe Castro, a great piano player. And his girlfriend was Doris Duke. So a couple of times we went up to Doris Duke's home and we jam all night. And I, I was like the, still the disc jockey buddy of these guys. And so we'd hang out, hang out and uh, go to places like that. And one night uh, we jammed all night and uh, she cooked breakfast for us the next morning. So we can boast that breakfast was cooked for us by Doris Duke. <laughs> When you listen to the radio today, you'll find that most stations change their format on a regular basis. They're always searching for that sound or personality that's going to drive an audience to their wavelength. With rock and roll music in the 60s, there was an opportunity to grab hold of the music, the artists, the disc jockeys, and dominate the local airwaves. All it took was a visionary. I was a KIKI. And uh, Henry J. Kaiser, a great visionary, built the Hawaiian Village Hotel. And he wanted to have a radio station, I guess, and uh, he saw what was happening in radio and felt he could do better. And so he built a radio station on the top floor of the Hawaiian Village Hotel. And he got J. Aku Head Pupuli to be the manager and do his morning show. Well, Aku hated rock. So uh, Mr. Kaiser felt that this young music should be played on his radio station. So he himself called some principals of schools to see who the kids were listening to. Well, of course, I won because I was the only one playing rock and roll. So I got hired by uh, Henry J. Kaiser to did, do... Uh, did he call you himself? Uh, it went through Ron Jacobs, who was working for him as a uh, good music disc jockey with Aku. And Ron called me and said, uh, Mr. Kaiser wants to hire you. So that's how it came together. I met Mr. Kaiser, and it was very exciting. <laughs> and even though he didn't like the kind of music you'd be playing, he knew... Well, Mr. Kaiser, I, I, he was pretty open. It was Aku. He was Aku. And, and, even, and, even to... When he, he died, up to the, Aku was like the, the top, one of the top disc jockeys in the world. He was at one time the highest paid disc jockey performing in Honolulu in the whole world. But he, he, even, he even boasted to what, just before he died that he never played a Beatles record. <laughs> and, and Mr. Kaiser didn't say, Aku, you work for me. You're going to play rock and roll. No, he didn't force Aku to play rock and roll. But he said you should have a, a young guy playing the young music at night. So Aku went along with it. And, so you uh, had a f definite franchise there. Oh, yeah. And so Ron was in the afternoon, and he started playing rock and roll. And then I was, uh, I was uh, doing uh, 9 to Midnight. And I do a mid-morning show also. So I was doing 9 to noon and uh, 9 to midnight. So the, a pattern emerges. You, you like to work, you work a lot. I mean, you, you work yeah. multiple shifts. Yeah. So that was my pattern. I, I, I would work two shifts. And Ron would be in the afternoon. He was a bad guy. I was a good guy. How did that play out? It played out great. Uh, one time, the roller derby was very big here in the 50s. Oh, I remember. And, uh, <laughs> so we talked up doing a grudge match with Jacobs, the bad guy, and myself, the good guy. So we picked a night uh, that was slow at the Civic Auditorium where the average crowd was 1,200 people. So we worked a deal out with Mr. Ralphie Mpuku, who was, ran the Civic, that uh, we would get a piece of every ticket over 1,200. Well, we started talking this thing up, and that night, 3,600 people showed up. It was packed. <laughs> and, and, and there's a hat story? Yeah, uh, this was in 1956 for the premiere of Love Me, Love Me Tender at the Waikiki Theater. Well, we set up so I would have a teen premiere on a Saturday afternoon before it opened for the general public, just for kids on a, it was a Saturday morning, really, at the Waikiki Theater. And I got the hat, the actual hat, that Elvis wore and loved me tender. But the kids had never seen Elvis on the screen before. And so we had this contest. I got 53,000 letters trying to win the hat. 53,000? Yeah. yeah. It was wild. It was the first time I've heard girls scream in a theater, at a movie. 
That was at the Waikiki Theater. So that was the beginning of Elvis in Hawaii, I just so. on screen. Yeah. And then... Well, what happened, I think, was that uh, the following year, Elvis had an open time period, and I think Colonel Parker, you know, remembered this contest and all the fan mail that kids wrote from Hawaii. I would give Elvis his address out and talk about Elvis and play his records. And I think Colonel Parker remembered that, and so to fill that one date that they needed, they decided to come to Hawaii, and that's why Elvis came to Hawaii in November of 1957. What was that like? Oh, that was something. <laughs> that was something. Was that the mo was that one of the most memorable uh, yes. experiences you've had? Yes, in music, and and just about one of the most memorable experiences, just introducing Elvis on stage, and watch what happened, and watch him on stage, with really no no visual support that performers have today. Uh, they moved the boxing ring that they used at uh, uh, the old stadium, and that was his stage. This is the old Honolulu Stadium? Yes, uh, the one on where King and Eisenberg, the stadium park there now. But I introduced him on his first concert, and there he, here's a stage, it's a boxing ring. They'd taken the poles off, but they still had the uh, overhead lights. That was his lighting. <laughs> the overhead lights, and that was it. And just, you know, just his magnetism held that audience. And of course, he's a great performer, great singer. Who, who was backing him up? Uh, his regular guys, the, the, the Nashville guys that, that recorded with him, they came here and backed him up. What did you say in introducing him? Oh, I, I don't know, some, the man, you've, you've, you've come here to see him and you could just feel the excitement. And I, I went to Colonel Parker, he said, go up and introduce him. I said, well, where is Elvis? He said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Just go up and introduce Elvis. So uh, there was a limousine parked over by the dressing room, not the dressing room, the dugouts. So yeah. you hadn't met him at the time you were introducing him? Yes, I had. I'll tell you that story, but <laughs> that's another <laughs> one. But anyway, I introduced uh, Elvis Presley. The place went crazy. It was so exciting. Really high decibels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there he was, just a, a microphone, and a simple sound system, but he held that audience. and. The most unforgettable moment that I've ever experienced with a performer is watching him do his encore. He did Hound Dog, rock and roll, yeah? And he came back and he got down on his knees on the stage and did a slow version of You Ain't Nothing, real slow. And then he jumped off the stage on his knees and down on the ground doing Hound Dog, slow. It was something. <laughs> and when had you met him before that? Well, the day before, uh, Ron and I, Ron Jacobs and I, Ron figured this one out, do something different. And we kind of, we'd met the Colonel and we kind of hit it, there might be something like this in the works. And uh, Don Tyler was one of our guys at Cape Boy and we dressed him up to look like Elvis. Ron had this convertible, uh, a Ford convertible, hard top convertible, top went down. And uh, got a fellow who looked like Colonel Parker and Ron driving and we had it all planned. I'm on the radio. From the moment Elvis arrived, I'm on the radio playing nothing but Elvis records. And I did this all morning, into the afternoon. So I, I kind of planned it. Well, it's, it, 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 we, we, we understand that Elvis is heading for Kailua. So people will be out in the streets waiting for, looking for Elvis and drive down streets and people are screaming. And we did this in different neighborhoods. Did you get any uh, fallout from it? Well, we got back to the studio. By then, I'd played Elvis for six straight hours, at least. It was mid-afternoon, and uh, we're patting ourselves in the back, and we get the message from our news guy that uh, Colonel Parker wants to see you guys upstairs, or downstairs, immediately. dun da dun, dun Oh, and we looked at each other. We want to escape. So we went downstairs, and there's guards at the elevator. We went down one floor, and they took us into uh, Colonel Parker's suite. Colonel said, uh, we didn't know what to expect. Colonel said, boys, that was a pretty good promotion you did. And, oh, my gosh. Oh, and here's Elvis. And walked Elvis. And that's the first time I'd met Elvis. And he'd heard all about it? <laughs> uh, I don't know how much Elvis had heard about it. But uh, Colonel said, uh, these boys did a nice promotion today, and I've asked them to introduce you tomorrow at the stadium. So Mr. Moffat's going to introduce you in your first show, and uh, Mr. Jacobs in the evening show. <laughs> wow, so you scored oh, on that. Oh, wow, that was a relief. <laughs> <laughs> and, and since then, we've been, the, the, the became such, such good friends with the Colonel. And so subsequently, whenever Elvis came here, I was the first guy with a microphone to talk to him, and sometimes the only one.
For a young man who grew up working on a farm in Michigan, these were heady times. Tom Moffat was a popular disc jockey on a radio station that was dominating the airwaves. He was living in paradise, surrounded by teenagers who hungered for the culture and the music of rock and roll. The next time we talk with Tom Moffat, we'll see how he and the Poi Boys of K-Poi Radio grabbed the local audience by giving them everything they wanted and how Tom made a career out of feeding that hunger with more than just the sound coming out of a transistor radio. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho! For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. You had a pretty good voice, too, as far as singing. I mean, <laughs> tell us about making a record yourself. Uh, this local uh, record company owner, Bob Bertram, who went on to record Robin Luke's Susie Darling, which became the first top ten rock and roll hit to make it outside of Hawaii all over the country. But he came to me and said, look, these guys can make records, why don't you? So we picked uh, Beyond the Reef, which was the Alfred Apaka hit song, which was very popular back in the 50s. And Mr. Bertram said, look, you know, to push this record, you've got to sing it when you MC shows. Now, uh, Alfred Apaka was the singing star of Henry J. Kaiser's Topper Room at the Hawaiian Village Hotel. So I was all set to sing it that night. I'd rehearsed it that afternoon with the band. So I came out to MC the show and I looked down the front row. There's Mr. and Mrs. Henry J. Kaiser and Alfred Apaka sitting in the front row. I didn't sing it that night. <laughs>